I wanted to discuss 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 regarding the man of sin. And I'm going to show you and reveal some things to you about it that is going to astonish you. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Messiah is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that's called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And what is truth? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He's talking about not being deceived by a man and that that man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition, who exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he's God. And now I've talked about this several times. In a previous video, I showed you what God had revealed to me, that the crescent moon God was once known as sin and was always known as sin. And of the hundred names of the crescent moon god, Sin, the first name is the greatest deceiver. One of his names is the withholder. Now I want to read the portion from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting at verse 5 in the New King James Version. It says, Do you not remember that when I was still with you I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. One of the names of the crescent moon God is the restrainer and the withholder and the greatest deceiver. All of those names apply to the crescent moon God known as sin. And by the way, I don't need a thousand comments saying the restrainer is the Holy Spirit. I know that version of the story. That's what I've always believed. That's what all the pastors preach. I'm just telling you that these are names of the hundred names of the crescent moon God, sin. And he's talking about the man of sin, the deceiver being revealed, the lawless one. And what is lawlessness? but being without the Torah of God, the law of God given to Moses on Mount Sinai. And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. He who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. 
And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie and that they all might be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And it continues on, but we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. First, I want to tell you something that I ran across in my research when I was doing my book. And that is, in ancient Babylon, they were actually worshiping the cow and I found a cow with a depiction of the crescent moon on the middle of the forehead with the star, like a mark of the beast. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it's talking about the deceiver, the man of sin, being revealed, the lawless one, the son of perdition, the one who has created iniquity from the beginning that God will slay with the breath of his mouth. This is something new that you've probably never heard and so I'm sharing it. I know what the traditional statements are about this verse and the Holy Spirit so please don't write me a million things telling me that's what it means because I already know that. But I'm showing you something that the Lord revealed to me about the names of this crescent moon God. And they're all mentioned in this verse. So now I'm going to reveal everything that the Lord has shown me and from the New World Encyclopedia about sin. We have the word Nana, like something you'd call a grandmother but it actually came from this ancient false god. Nana, also called Sin, or Suen, was a Sumerian god who played a long-standing role in Mesopotamian religion and mythology. He was the god of the moon, the son of the sky god, Enlil, and the grain goddess, Ninlil. His sacred city was Ur, and temples dedicated to him have been found throughout Mesopotamia. The daughters of Mesopotamian kings were often assigned to be his high priestesses. The worship of Nana, or Sin, was associated with the breeding of cattle, which was a key part of the economy of the lower Euphrates Valley. Known as Nana in summer, he was named Sin, contracted from Suen. In the later civilizations of Babylonia and Assyria, where he had a major temple in Haran, his wife was the reed goddess Ningal, or Great Lady, who bore him Shamash, Sumerian Utu, son, and Ishtar, the goddess of love and war. In later centuries, he became part of an astral triad consisting of himself and his two great children, representing the positions of the sun and morning star Venus. In art, his symbols are the crescent moon, the bull, and the tripod. Sin had a beard made of lapis lazuli and rode on a winged bull. The two chief seats of Sin's worship were Ur in the south and later Haran to the north. From about 2600 to 2400 BCE, when Ur was the leading city of the Euphrates Valley, Sin seems to have held the position of the head of the pantheon. 
It was during this period that he inherited such titles as father of the gods, chief of the gods, and creator of all things, which were assigned to other deities in other periods. The cult of sin spread to other centers and temples of the moon god have been found in all large cities of Babylonia and Assyria. Sin's chief sanctuary was at Ur and was named Egishagal, house of the great light. In spring, a procession from Ur, led by the priests of Nana, Sin, made a ritual journey to Nippur, the city of Enlil, bringing the year's first dairy products. Sin's sanctuary at Haran was named Ikulkul, House of Joys. Inanna Ishtar often played an important role in these temples as well. On cylinder seals, Sin is represented as an old man with a flowing beard with the crescent as his symbol. In the later astrotheological system, he is represented by the number 30 and the moon, often in crescent form. This number probably refers to the average number of days in a lunar month as measured between successive new moons. Writings often refer to him as Enzu, meaning Lord of Wisdom. About 550 BCE, Nabonidus, the last of the Neo-Babylonian kings, showed particular devotion to Sin. His mother had been Sin's high priestess at Haran, and he placed his daughter in the same position at Ur. Some scholars believe that Nabonidus promoted Sin as the national god of Babylon, superior even to Marduk, who had been promoted to the king of the gods since the time of Hammurabi. In any case, Nabonidus' support for the temples of Sin seems to have alienated the priests at the capital of Babylon who were devoted to Marduk and consequently denigrated Nabonidus for his lack of attention to his religious duties in the capital. They later welcomed Cyrus the Great of Persia when he overthrew Nabonidus. After this, Sin continued to play a role in Mesopotamian religion, but a waning one. In Canaanite mythology, he was known as Yarek. His daughter Ishtar, meanwhile, came to play a major role among the Canaanites as Astarte. The Hebrew patriarch Abraham had connections both to Ur and Haran, where he certainly must have encountered the moon god as a major presence. His descendants, the Israelites, rejected all deities but Yahweh, and they apparently retained the new moon festivals of their Mesopotamian ancestors. Numbers 10.10 10 thus instructs that at your times of rejoicing, your appointed feasts and new moon festivals, you are to sound the trumpets over your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, and they will be a memorial for you before your God. Christian writers have sometimes seen a connection between sin and the Muslim god Allah, noting that before his conversion to Islam, Muhammad himself worshipped several deities, including the moon, and that Islam adopted Nana's crescent as its symbol. Now, if you'll remember, one of the evil things that went on in ancient Israel was this worship of Moloch, which looked like a bull, and the horns were shaped like the crescent moon. That's one of the images of the false god Sin, who is known as the greatest deceiver, also known as Satan, because Satan is the deceiver. And of course, when you had the golden calf that was built against the Lord that came out of Egypt, that bull, Apis, that they drew and inscribed on the rock at the base of the holy mountain of God before Moses could come down from the mountain with the covenant of God. They were worshiping the golden calf. That's the one out of Egypt. Of course, it had the disc between its horns. They also worshipped the dragon in Babylon, 
and the dragon was depicted on the blue tiles of the gate of Babylon, the one that I'm sure that the prophet Daniel entered as he entered Babylon with the other royals of Judah. Nobody talks about the fact that Daniel and the others that were with him that went into the fiery furnace, they were all of the tribe of Judah. They were the royalty, the descendants of the house of David. And so when one appeared in the fiery furnace that saved them and they were not touched or harmed by the fire, it was the one who looked like the Son of God, the Messiah that came to save them and they were not harmed. And he is the ultimate King of Kings of the tribe of Judah. And their names were Azariah, Hananiah, and Mishael. So let me reiterate that in Babylon they worshipped the cow, the beast that had the crescent moon mark on the middle of its forehead. The mark of the beast, if you understand it like that. It goes way back. So let's revisit Deuteronomy 9 where Moses said, So I turned and came down from the mount, and the mount burned with fire. And the two tables of the covenant were in my two hands. And I looked, and behold, ye had sinned against the Lord your God, and had made you a molten calf. Ye had turned aside quickly out of the way which the Lord had commanded you. And I took the two tables and cast them out of my two hands, and brake them before your eyes. And I fell down before the Lord, as at first, forty days and forty nights. I did neither eat bread nor drink water because of all your sins which ye sinned in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure wherewith the Lord was wroth against you to destroy you. But the Lord hearkened unto me at that time also, and the Lord was very angry with Aaron to have destroyed him. And I prayed for Aaron also the same time. And I took your sin, the calf which ye had made, and burnt it with fire, and stamped it, and ground it very small, even until it was as small as dust. And I cast the dust thereof into the brook that descended out of the mount." Very clearly Moses states that he took their sin, the calf which they had made, and burned it with fire, and stamped it, and ground it to dust. These things are an abomination to the true and living God. And Matthew 24, verse 21, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Messiah, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false messiahs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, the Messiah prophesied that his elect will be deceived. And during the time of the Great Tribulation, if they appoint a Messiah other than the one that's coming down from heaven, then do not follow him. Because it says, Wherefore, if they shall say to you, Behold, He's in the desert. You don't want to hear them say the Messiah is over there at Mount Sinai in Arabia. He's out there at Mount Horeb. Don't go out to the wilderness. 
Behold, he's in the secret chambers. Believe it not. If they build the third temple and they tell you that the Messiah is in the Holy of Holies, he's in the secret chamber, don't believe it. Because, for as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. And immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the star shall fall from heaven. You know, interesting that what they worshipped was the sun, moon, and star in Babylon. And going way back in ancient, ancient times. And I actually believe this was the deception. The deceiver Satan was in the garden of God and deceived Eve and Adam. And death came upon them by Satan himself. This is what Satan is trying to do on the Temple Mount is to seat himself on God's holy Mount Moriah in the Temple of God claiming that he is God and that he's greater than God. And the powers of the heavens shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. The second coming of Jesus Christ, Yeshua, for those who have gone through the tribulation and believed in him finally. Now, was the man of sin in the Garden of Eden? Was the greatest deceiver in the Garden of Eden deceiving those making them believe a lie so that they all might be damned who love not the truth that God is the giver of life? He's not a deceiver. He's the God of the universe who created everything and he came to save us and give us salvation to deliver us from the hands of this evil abomination that was created in the Garden of Eden with the serpent, the dragon, Satan, the son of perdition. Now I want to show you something I've already told you that Adnan Akhtar the Turk was meeting with the elite elect rabbis of Israel, of the Sanhedrin court and the Sanhedrin in general, and they have stated that they believe that Islam was there in the beginning and they say that it was the original religion. So, what is the deception and lie at the end that people will believe? They all loved not the truth, which is Messiah Yeshua, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who came to deliver us from the wrath to come, and they accepted a lie, which is that this crescent moon God is God, greater than God. All of this they've been deceived by a lie of Satan. They need to repent and see the truth and follow the way, the truth, and the life, which Messiah Yeshua said he is the way, the truth, and the life. I want to show you an excerpt of one of these leading Sanhedrin rabbis now invoking the name of the crescent moon god, Sin. And of course, Moses himself said that Sin was the golden calf at Mount Sinai and Mount Horeb. In the crescent with the star is the mark on the forehead of the cow in Babylon. The mark 
of a beast. And now I want to show you the clip of several other leading elite rabbis saying that they believe that this crescent moon god goes back to the beginning that they believe it was the original religion and of course if Satan was in the Garden of Eden of course he was there and sinned against God because he's the man of sin the son of perdition you won't believe your ears when you see this and we're using this to show people in good faith with the fair use doctrine showing this clip of the elite Sanhedrin members invoking the name of the crescent moon god as though he is their god. Also these rabbis state that the Muslims are the followers of the Noahide laws. So that connects Islam with the Noahide and we all know what that means. Now I'm not calling anybody the Antichrist or anything right here but I did want to point out if the man of sin was in the Garden of Eden already Satan the deceiver, serpent and he was in the Garden the man of sin the crescent moon god that caused people to die and he was there in God's garden from the beginning isn't it interesting that Obama who is a Muslim had his portrait showing him sitting in the middle of a garden I just wanted to point that out and Please don't leave 20,000 comments about Obama. <laughs> if you know what I mean, I just, I don't want to hear about him being the Antichrist and all this stuff. I'm just pointing out that all of this kind of comes together. Satan was there in the beginning in the garden where God was and the people ate the fruit of that tree and died because of it. And because of that curse, we are all under it. The whole world, all the animals, all the birds, everything. And Jesus, Yeshua, came to save us from this catastrophe. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And he's the only way back to enter in to the former state of living forever if we eat the fruit of the tree of life. If you refuse to eat the fruit of this tree, you will not live forever, but will perish because there's no other way to go back to the eternal state of being but through the one true God of Israel, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, came to save us. And I just wanted to remind you that the number of his name is 666, the number of the crescent moon god, the ones that the Muslims call Allah, that is the number of his name. That was revealed by Walid Shobat a few years back, and they put it on a closed book of the Quran 666 on the top so it all comes together revealing the son of perdition and I also wanted to mention because Nancy Anderson mentioned something about the little horn and this is something I forgot to tell you in the interview with Adnan Akhtar the Turk when he was going to show a shofar that he said they were going to bring out and blow this big shofar in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount when they bring out the Ark of the Covenant he said he was going to be standing there with the Pope and with the Sanhedrin leaders and he refuses to say whether he's the Mahdi or not okay but people there's a book called the Mahdi wears Armani about him 
and it's been out for numerous years now over there in the Middle East. But I wanted to tell you when he brought out this picture that he was going to show of the shofar, it really hit me. He says something like, um, oh, don't we have uh, the big one, the, pig, the picture of the big horn, whatever. All of a sudden it hit me, the little horn. He brings out a picture of the little horn. It was an English hunting horn. So that's another thing that the Holy Spirit just kind of zing, <laughs> the little horn rising. And he made that statement about, you know, that told Jeremy Gimpel they need to get all of these Arab countries together, just like what they're doing right now with this agreement, the Abrahamic Accord. They need to get all these Islamic nations together with Israel, and they will rebuild the Temple of Solomon. Now, of course, a lot of these people are Masons, and he is a 33rd degree Mason that they have selected and honored. And they gave him these ornate necklaces that were profoundly beautiful. But they have interacted with him in ways that are like, why? <laughs> you know? So, right here we have an interview with the Sanhedrin members Rabbi Hollander, Rabbi Abrahamson. One more thing I forgot to mention is that Adnan Akhtar has this whole genealogical chart claiming to be from the tribe of Judah from the line of King David. So there's a lot of strange things going on there. But he basically has this creepy harem of women and you know they look like prostitutes basically. So and he has a compound, several compounds. Anyway, with no further ado, here it is. The title of this video is Islam Declared by Rabbi as Mankind's Original Faith. And this was uploaded January of 2011. This is Rabbi Abrahamson on the left with the big beard from the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem with other rabbis. About a, a common heritage. Uh, in our Jewish literature, we are taught that there is such a thing as a common faith, a fundamental religion which all men are born into. And this is a basic faith which is obligated on all mankind. In the past, we've called it by different names, the uh, Yirei Shemayim, which means the fear of heaven, the people who have fear of heaven, Gertoshav, or B'nai Noach, the children of uh, Noah or during Hellenist times in Greek it was called Theos uh, and according to the school of thought of Rabbi ben uh, this fundamental faith is also called by the name Islam. Some have suggested that this refers to the great number of non-Jewish believers who came to sacrifice the Qurban Shlami in Jerusalem together with the Jews. Salami, Muslimai, Muslimi. This could be a clear indication in, in our literature that Islam is an ancient religion dating back to the time of the Second Temple, or, uh, or even earlier. And if Islam's roots, if the roots of Islam are the same as what we call B'nai Noah, then for us, it is much older. This is the religion of Noah. This is the religion of Adam himself. The, the closeness of, of Islam and Judaism has always been understood by biblical scholars un until recent years. The close relationship with the Jews, the, the ten lost tribes, uh, the, the Arabs, the Rechabites, all this was assumed to be true. It was only with the advent of German revisionists like Wellhausen and Buchler and others who, that this began to change. They introduced ideas that Islam had something to do with worshipping the moon, rocks, or some asteroid that fell. But devout, Jew devout Jews know that this is not true. It's a fact of Jewish law that we believe that Muslims and Muslims are perfect monotheists. They worship the same God that we do. 
if the deceiver was in the Garden of Eden and he's saying that that was the original religion of Adam, let's see how. In Romans 5, verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. So the Messiah came as the second perfect Adam to let us take and eat of the tree of life so that we may live forever. It goes on to say in Romans 5, verse 15, But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift for the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah. Verse 18, Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through the righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord, Messiah Yeshua, our Savior, who redeemed us by the blood of the Lamb, the one pure sacrifice of the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world and you are saved because he died, experienced the death, and he was raised to life because the Holy Spirit of the living God dwells in him. And eternal life is through him. And that's the only way you're gonna have eternal life is through Jesus Christ, the Messiah. I already told you in my last video that Yehuda Glick had invoked the name of the Crescent Moon God not once but quite a few times when he was being interviewed by Adnan Akhtar the Turk. I'm the chairman of the, the foundation, the Temple Mount Foundation uh, in Jerusalem. God is one, his royalty is one, his name is one, or as you say it, in the Quran, Allah Wahad, Allah Samad, Lam Yallad Wa Lam Yullad. God is one, God is eternal, and, this is the, and our dream is to announce it, unite it, announce it to the world. And this is what our foundation is trying to do together, and this is why I'm here here today in Turkey. Inshallah, Inshallah, Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim, Alhamdulillah, Rabb Al Alameen, Rahman, Rahim, Malik Ayyum Adin. This is Yehuda Glick invoking the name of the Crescent Moon God 
and inviting all of these people to come to pray and worship the one true God on the Temple Mount. And this is his Ramadan message. A house of prayer that unites all nations to the one and only God. From Jerusalem, allow me to wish you all Ramadan Kareem, Allah Yavorak, Allah Kulu, and all of every one of you should be blessed by God. From Jerusalem, the city of peace, city of shalom. This is all I have to show you for now. I hope that these things open your mind and heart to see more in times details that the Lord's revealed now for such a time as this and don't be deceived. I pray you are stunned by what you've heard and that you truly can see how all of this is coming to pass before our eyes. For these things to be revealed at this time indicates that the Lord is close at hand and to believe in the Messiah, our Savior, Jesus Christ, Yeshua, Hanatsri Melech HaYehudin, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the descendant of King David, that's the rightful heir to the throne of the Kingdom of Judah. And with this, I leave you probably stunned but it has to be shown and said what's really going on and how the two of these groups of people are coming together and we know how it all goes in the book of Revelation and I'm just revealing parts of what's going on.